This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Servile State by Hilaire Belloc Section 8 To whom could the new industry turn for capitalization? The small owner had already disappeared. The corporate life and mutual obligations which had supported him and confirmed him in his property had been broken to pieces by no economic development, but by the deliberate action of the rich. He was ignorant because his schools had been taken from him and the universities closed to him. He was the more ignorant because the common life which once nourished his social sense and the cooperative arrangements which had once been his defense had disappeared. When you sought an accumulation of corn, of clothing, of housing, of fuel, as the indispensable preliminary to the launching of your new industry, when you looked round for someone who could find the accumulated wealth necessary for these considerable experiments, you had to turn to the class which had already monopolized the bulk of the means of production in England. The rich men alone could furnish you with those supplies. Nor was this all. The supplies once found, and the adventure capitalized, that form of human energy which lay best to hand, which was indefinitely exploitable, weak, ignorant, and desperately necessitous, ready to produce for you upon almost any terms, and glad enough if you would only keep it alive, was the existing proletariat which the new plutocracy had created when, in cornering the wealth of the country after the Reformation, they had thrust out the mass of Englishmen from the possession of implements, of houses, and of land. The rich class, adopting some new process of production for its private gain, worked it upon those lines of mere competition which its avarice had already established. Cooperative tradition was dead. Where would it find its cheapest labor? Obviously among the proletariat, not among the remaining small owners. What class would increase under the new wealth? Obviously the proletariat again, without responsibilities, with nothing to leave to his progeny. And as they swelled the capitalist gain, they enabled him with increasing power to buy out the small owner, and send him to swell by another tributary, the proletarian mass. It was upon this account that the Industrial Revolution, as it is called, took in its very origins the form which has made it an almost unmixed curse for the unhappy society in which it has flourished. The rich, already possessed of the accumulations by which that industrial change could alone be nourished, inherited all its succeeding accumulations of implements and all its increasing accumulations of subsistence. The factory system, starting upon a basis of capitalist and proletariat, grew in the mold which had determined its origins. With every new advance the capitalist looked for proletariat grist to feed the productive mill. Every circumstance of that society, the form in which the laws that governed ownership and profit were cast, the obligations of partners, the relations between master and man, directly made for the indefinite expansion of a subject, formless, wage-earning class, controlled by a small body of owners, which body would tend to become smaller and richer still, and to be possessed of power ever greater and greater as the bad business unfolded. The spread of economic oligarchy was everywhere, and not in industry alone. The great landlords destroyed deliberately, and of set purpose, and to their own advantage, the common rights over common land. The small plutocracy with which they were knit up, and with whose mercantile elements they were now fused, directed everything to its own ends. That strong central government which should protect the community against the rapacity of a few had gone generations before. Capitalism triumphant wielded all the mechanisms of legislation and of information. It still holds them, and there is not an example of so-called social reform today which is not demonstrably, though often subconsciously, 
directed to the further entrenchment and confirmation of an industrial society in which it is taken for granted that a few shall own that the vast majority shall live at a wage under them and that all the bulk of english men may hope for is the amelioration of their lot by regulations and by control from above not by property not by freedom we all feel and those few of us who have analyzed the matter not only feel but know that the capitalist society thus gradually developed from its origins in the capture of the land four hundred years ago has reached its term it is almost self-evident that it cannot continue in the form which now three generations have known and it is equally self-evident that some solution must be found for the intolerable and increasing instability with which it has poisoned our lives but before considering the solutions variously presented by various schools of thought i shall in my next section show how and why the english capitalist industrial system is thus intolerably unstable and consequently presents an acute problem which must be solved under pain of social death it must be noted that modern industrialism has spread to many other centres from england it bears everywhere the features stamped upon it by its origin in this country section five the capitalist state in proportion as it grows perfect grows unstable from the historical digression which i have introduced by way of illustrating my subject in the last two sections i now return to the general discussion of my thesis and to the logical process by which it may be established the capitalist state is unstable and indeed more properly a transitory phase lying between two permanent and stable states of society in order to appreciate why this is so let us recall the definition of the capitalist state a society in which the ownership of the means of production is confined to a body of free citizens not large enough to make up properly a general character of that society while the rest are dispossessed of the means of production and are therefore proletarian we call capitalist note the several points of such a state of affairs you have private ownership but it is not private ownership distributed in many hands and thus familiar as an institution to society as a whole again you have the great majority dispossessed but at the same time citizens that is men politically free to act though economically impotent again though it is but an inference from our definition it is a necessary inference that there will be under capitalism a conscious direct and planned exploitation of the majority the free citizens who do not own by the minority who are owners for wealth must be produced the whole of that community must live and the possessors can make such terms with the non-possessors as shall make it certain that a portion of what the non-possessors have produced shall go to the possessors a society thus constituted cannot endure it cannot endure because it's subject to two very severe strains strains which increase in severity in proportion as that society becomes more thoroughly capitalist the first of these strains arises from the divergence between the moral theories upon which the state reposes and the social facts which those moral theories attempt to govern the second strain arises from the insecurity to which capitalism condemns the great mass of society and the general character of anxiety and peril which it imposes upon all citizens but in particular upon the majority which consists under capitalism of dispossessed free men of these two strains it is impossible to say which is the gravest either would be enough to destroy a social arrangement in which it was long present the two combined make that destruction certain and there is no longer any doubt that capitalist society must transform itself into some other and more stable arrangement it is the object of these pages to discover what that stable arrangement will probably be we say that there is a moral strain already intolerably severe and growing more severe with every perfection of capitalism this moral strain comes from a contradiction between the realities of capitalist and the moral base of our laws and tradition 
the moral base upon which our laws are still administered and our conventions raised presupposes a state composed of free citizens our laws defend property as a normal institution with which all citizens are acquainted and which all citizens respect it punishes theft as an abnormal incident only occurring when through evil motives one free citizen acquires the property of another without his knowledge and against his will it punishes fraud as another abnormal incident in which from evil motives one free citizen induces another to part with his property upon false representations it enforces contract the sole moral base of which is the freedom of the two contracting parties and the power of either if it so please him not to enter into a contract which once entered into must be enforced it gives to an owner the power to leave his property by will under the conception that such ownership and such passage of property to natural heirs as a rule but exceptionally to any other whom the testator may point out is the normal operation of a society generally familiar with such things and finding them part of the domestic life lived by the mass of its citizens it casts one citizen in damages if by any wilful action he has caused loss to another for it presupposes him able to pay the sanction upon which social life reposes is in our moral theory the legal punishment enforceable in our courts and the basis presupposed for the security and the material happiness of our citizens is the possession of goods which shall guarantee us from anxiety and permit us an independence of action in the midst of our fellow-men now contrast all this the moral theory upon which society is still perilously conducted the moral theory to which capitalism itself turns for succor when it is attacked contrast i say its formula and its presuppositions with the social reality of a capitalist state such as england today property remains as an instinct perhaps with most of the citizens as an experience and a reality it is unknown to nineteen out of twenty one hundred forms of fraud the necessary corollary of unrestrained competition between a few and of unrestrained avarice as the motive controlling production are not or cannot be punished petty forms of violence in theft and of cunning in fraud the law can deal with but they cannot deal with these alone our legal machinery has become little more than an engine for protecting the few owners against the necessities the demands or the hatreds of the masses of their dispossessed fellow-citizens the vast bulk of so-called free contracts are to-day leonine contracts arrangements which one man was free to take or leave but which the other man was not free to take or leave because the second had for his alternative starvation most important of all the fundamental social fact of our movement far more important than any security afforded by law or than any machinery which the state can put into action is the fact that livelihood is at the will of the possessors it can be granted by the possessors to the non-possessors or it can be withheld the real sanction in our society for the arrangements by which it is conducted is not punishment enforceable by the courts but the withholding of livelihood from the dispossessed by the possessors most men now fear the loss of employment more than they fear legal punishment and the discipline under which men are coerced in their modern forms of activity in england is the fear of dismissal the true master of the englishman to-day is not the sovereign nor the officers of the state nor save indirectly the laws his true master is the capitalist of these main truths everyone is aware and anyone who sets out to deny them does so to-day at the peril of his reputation either for honesty or for intelligence if it be asked why things have come to a head so late capitalism having been in growth for so long the answer is that england even now the most completely capitalist state of the modern world did not itself become a completely capitalist state until the present generation within the memory of men now living half england was agricultural with relations domestic rather than competitive between the various human factors to production end of section eight